Uh, let me start uh, with the disclaimer. I, if you, with your permission, I'll take this as read, but I would encourage you to uh, look at our public filings, uh, both in the UK and the United States. So a quick overview of the company. Uh, we are a drug delivery biotechnology company. We have three technologies. I'm pleased to tell you about later on in the presentation. We're dual listed on the A market of London Stock Exchange and in NASDAQ in the US. We're headquartered in Cardiff, where we have offices and a pilot scale uh, manufacturing and laboratory. We have about 22 employees. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you today that the company has a little bit of a checkered history. Um, it IPO'd on the back of some technology around 12 nanoparticles and uh, at the same time merged with another business called QCHIP, uh, in which today resides the QSERA technology here in Wales. Um, shortly after listing, uh, the company attempted to convert itself into a specialty pharma company and acquired a US business called Dara Biosciences. That was not a success. Uh, it did not generate the profits and cash flow that it was intended to, uh, and was sold at a fairly significant loss in 2018. Uh, in 2020, uh, having uh, focused the company pretty much on a single product called MTD201, which was intended to be a bioequivalent form of Novartis's product, Sandostatin, uh, which is an octreotide indicated for acromegaly and neuroendocrine tumors. Um, it transpired that the data the company generated were rather better than the Novartis product. And so it could not be matched on a bioequivalent sort of generics basis and would require a full development program at a cost of about $30 million. COVID hit, the company couldn't raise money. So we had to restructure uh, the CEO left and I took on the role. And since then, we've uh, changed up the strategy a little bit, more along the lines of a traditional biotech. And I borrowed this phrase from the United States, a sort of multiple shots on goal strategy. And by that, I mean, we are, instead of working on a single product, we're working on nine or 10 products, but to a much earlier stage with a view to partnering them off uh, when we achieve proof of concept. We recognize we're giving up quite a lot of the upside by doing that. But we think we're also increasing the chances of partnering success and validation, uh, which is more appropriate for a company of our size and resources. And if we can generate enough partnerships, then at some point in the future, we might hope to hold on to these products for longer in the development process and capture more of the upside. So the three uh, technologies we have are Custera, Mitosol, and Mitocore. There is a common theme that runs through them. They are all designed to improve the bio-delivery and biodistribution of medicines. And by that, I mean delivering the right amount of medicine at the right time to the right place in the body, and thereby sort of improving uh, potential uh, efficacy and limiting side effects through systemic toxicity because we're delivering it to the, the place where the drug is needed. So Custera is a sustained delivery technology. We can convert immediate release uh, drugs into drugs that can be injected into the body, form a depot, and that depot will biodegrade from weeks, potentially up to six months. So we can deliver long-term drugs. Mitosol is a technology designed to convert inherently insoluble drugs into soluble drugs, so they can also be injected. And Mitocore is the original uh, gold nanoparticle-based drug delivery technology, which can be used to deliver and target agents uh, in the body. So this is what our current pipeline looks like. And I'm just gonna sort of expand the arrows to show what progress we've made in the last half year. This is a combination of internal programs and partnered programs. So we've got the QSERA programs of which there are five, two internal programs, Brexpiprazole and Tetrolimus, that I'll get to in a second and three partnered programs with a European affiliate of a large uh, multinational uh, healthcare company uh, who were not allowed to disclose their name, but their products will be in your medicine cabinet at home and uh, you will have for sure heard of them. Uh, we've got three indications using our Mitosol technology, all based on the panobinostat molecule. One is in diffuse intrinsic contingoma, 
uh, which is a childhood brain cancer, ultra rare. And we're about to initiate a study in glioblastoma multiforme, which is adult brain cancer, much more significant market. And we have an ongoing phase one trial uh, in medulloblastoma, a third type of brain cancer. And then lastly, deployed our mitochore technology uh, in a low, pretty low risk uh, topical treatment uh, of methotrexate combined with gold nanoparticles for mild to moderate psoriasis. So quite a lot going on in the company for a 20 person company. So let's start with our clinical assets, MTX110. Um, we've sort of reprioritized this program to focus uh, on GBM. GBM is uh, an intractable cancer. It uh, invariably recurs uh, after resection and radiation and almost universally ends in death. And the uh, treatment options are pretty limited for these patients. Uh, depending on their genetic presentation, survival ranges from 13 to 30 months. Uh, and we've been exploring GBM uh, preclinically uh, on the back of some pretty encouraging results that we saw in DIPG, which I'll get to in a second. So we have some uh, preclinical in vivo and in vitro analyses showing on the chart here, comparing a tumor volume and cell death uh, in multiple human patient derived uh, GBM cell lines. And it shows the drug is pretty effective at uh, therapeutic uh, concentrations. So that's pretty encouraging news, but I should warn you, these models don't always translate into human efficacy. So to prove the case, uh, we have recently filed uh, for an IND for a phase one pilot study that will be running in the United States uh, in a handful of patients, maybe 10, 12 patients uh, looking for a signal, uh, both in terms of safety and efficacy. And that those data should report out sometime towards the back end of next year. I do need to talk a little bit of a, a caveat here. In the panabinostat molecule is still under patent and we are not owners of that patent. The patent owners uh, actually terminated our license, we think on spurious grounds. That termination of license means that uh, we will not be able to launch a product until uh, 2026. That won't have an effect on this GBM product, but it could delay the lo potential launch of uh, MTX110 for DIPG, which could be uh, available earlier than that. DIPG is an, also an intractable uh, brain cancer in children. Uh, university, again, leads to death, um, typically around 10 months from diagnosis. We have data from a phase one study we did with UCSF, which were reported last October. The study was principally focused on safety. Uh, and despite the fact that we got very significant concentrations of drug into the tumor, the drug-related side effects were relatively minimal. And the reason for that is in both DIPG and GBM, we're using a pretty unconventional drug delivery method. We are using a pump and a catheter to deliver the drug directly into the tumor itself thereby avoiding the so-called blood-brain barrier, which generally prevents drugs entering the brain for obvious reasons, and makes most uh, uh, brain cancer therapeutics relatively ineffective. But we're bypassing that. And these images on the right-hand side of the chart here are gadolinium enhanced contrast images, which show that we can get the drug into the ponds of the brain, which is exactly where the tumor resides in this particular case, with pretty good distribution of the drug throughout the tumor. Long story short, in the uh, seven patients that were included in this UCSF study, um, we achieved median survival uh, out of um, 26 months compared with 10 months in the literature. So that is a you know, major improvement of our current uh, treatment options, which are pretty limited, to be honest. And that's what encourages to uh, look at uh, GBM indication for this product. So let's switch gears now to Cusfera. 
Um, Kustera is based on industrial uh, 3D printing equipment. Uh, what we do is we dissolve a patent, excuse me, a polymer and a drug API together with a solvent, and we eject the, that combination through a print head into a stream of anti-solvent. And that's what the picture on the top left here is designed to show. Uh, that has the effect of immediately forming uh, remarkably monodispersed microspheres, which is the picture on the top right there. And each microsphere is generally of a uniform size, uh, it's spherical in shape, and uh, has a honeycomb center, as depicted bottom left, uh, with a, a, a uniform amount of drug included in each. The result of that is that the drug, the, the, the depot that's formed, um, can be tuned to deliver drug over two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, four weeks. Um, it can also, because of the uniformity of the microspheres, it makes the product much more injectable through a narrower gauge needle. We did some comparison work with an Avartis product that I referenced earlier. Their product is not nearly as monodispersed as ours. The needles clog 30% of the time. About a third of every batch has to be thrown away because some of the microspheres are too big and some are too small, et cetera, et cetera. And we can generate these droplets at about 120,000 uh, per second, which means we could make um, clinical scale batches in a matter of hours. And it also means that these uh, print heads can be parallelized, as in the picture on the bottom right, uh, and is scale up to manufacturing commercial quantities is uh, eminently achievable. So by changing the parameters of the temperatures, the pressures, the type of polymer, uh, we can optimize the drug loading, we get the drug loading up to about 20% maximum, and we can attenuate the burst release, make it higher or lower as required, and uh, improve injectability. So that's what I was meaning when I was talking about tunability of the system. The features and benefits, therefore, are sort of fairly obvious. We can increase the dosage regimen, which is more convenient for patients. Uh, less visits to doctor's offices, which takes cost out of the system. Injectability, I've already talked about. One of the things I do want to mention, and this is an area where we're beginning to explore now, partly driven by uh, our collaboration partner, is the targeting of these uh, microspheres. So one of the opportunities, for example, would be to uh, inject the, the product subcutaneously, which is less painful than intramuscularly, uh, and can be self-administered through auto-injected by the patient, again, taking costs out of the system. But we're also looking at intratumoral delivery of, of these Custera products. So what that would entail would be injecting the Custera, including the API, uh, directly, for example, into a tumor and have it stick there, and release the drug in the tumor over an extended period of time. Uh, in the absence of Custera technology, what you tend to find is that drugs are eliminated from tumors rather quickly. And this would be a way of avoiding that uh, and increasing the efficacy, and at the same time, reducing the systemic toxicity you get with most chemo agents, because all the drug is trapped inside the tumor rather than washing around the body. There are other opportunities too. There's a product on the market called Zoretta, not one of ours, but it is administered uh, intra-articularly for uh, osteoarthritis in the knee joint. Uh, and then we've also had data in-house where we've been able to formulate a product for interocular, specifically intravitreal uh, administration. So lots of opportunities for drug targeting. Here is some phase one data that we generated last year. Uh, and I was telling you about the Novartis product Sandostatin that we were trying to copy product is off market, but there are no generics on the market. On the right hand side here, you can see the pharmacokinetic blood levels of individual patients. Uh, and it's pretty obvious from the picture, they're all over the place. Our product on the left hand side was much more uniform. We got much more homogeneous results, predictable results. But unfortunately, it's very hard to match the Novartis product and hence would have required its own full clinical program, which at the time we couldn't afford. 
So as part of our multiple shots on goal strategy, we have two uh, earlier phase in-house programs. The first of which is a Justera formulation of Brex Piprazole. Brex Piprazole is the latest generation antipsychotic product. That whole market has moved to long acting products for mainly for patient compliance reasons, I believe. Uh, Brex Piprazole is the only one which is not available in a long acting formulation. Apiprazole is, uh, um, Palperidol is, uh, and the other Janssen product also is, uh, but Presbyprazole isn't. Here are data in animals showing that we can deliver the product over 90 days with nice sustainable uh, pharmacokinetic blood levels compared with the immediate release, which is eliminated rather quickly. So this product is uh, currently available for licensing. Uh, we have some tentative discussion going on with a number of parties. The second product in our in-house pipeline is tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is indicated for anti-transplant rejection. The issue with tacrolimus is it has a relatively narrow therapeutic index. By that, I mean it's easy to overdose it, in which case you over-suppress the immune system, you run all uh, problems associated with the infection and the like. Uh, and if you underdose it, uh, then you get transplant rejection. Both outcomes are very bad for patients, as you can imagine. So you want to keep the blood levels in an, inside a nice narrow range. So this product probably needs one more formulation round when burst release is a little high. But overall, we have a three week product here, 21 days, sustained blood levels. This is a single dose. Uh, that would be pretty good. Uh, for a patient who would otherwise have to take a tablet three times a day. Uh, and you, by taking a tablet three times a day, you've got three bursts and three dips in a pharmacokinetic profile, as you can probably imagine. The really, really big news for 2021 that we announced in the middle of this year, is, and we think this is the world's first, is that we have been able to formulate a protein, which is a particular type of molecule, very large molecule, about 150 uh, kilodaltons in size, very complex structure as illustrated by the diagram on the right there. Uh, and if you attempt any form of manufacturing process which involves shear forces, heat, or toxic type solvents, you end up denaturing the protein to the point where it's no longer does its job. Because our manufacturing system is relatively benign, we're only using class three type solvents, uh, we don't do that. And we've been able to prove that we've been able to formulate a protein using Qstera so we can deliver proteins for the first time over long periods of time. Right now they are uh, immediate release injections over long periods of time uh, for the advantage, for advantage to patients and payers. And here's the proof. On the left-hand side, we took uh, the immediate release protein exemplar and we heat killed it. And then we tested it against a, a unique one-for-one -one, um, antigen. And of course we got no inhibition, uh, which is what we'd expect because we heat killed the protein. We then took the immediate release protein and tried it again without heat killing it. We got 100% inhibition. We then form it, formulated the protein in Qstera and also got 100% inhibition, which is the result we would have hoped for and expected. Secondly, then we did the same experiment again, but at increasing levels of concentration. And the middle chart shows left to right, increasing levels of concentration, and we got increasing amounts of binding activity against the antigen. Again, proof of concept. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, We've been able to plot, we've got six weeks data, which we did have at this point, but a little bit more now, showing a release of the protein in vitro dissolution over a period of time. So, and it's still got active through that whole period of time. So we think this is opening up potential significant opportunities for MitoTech. Um, the monoclonal antibody part of the protein market alone is worth about $75 billion. That's just the top 10 product and all of them together are over $150 billion of sales. So we only need to partner up with one or two of those and uh, that would be pretty significant for our little company. So last technology, MitoCore. Um,
This technology has not been widely exploited in recent years, so we took the decision to uh, have one more go at it. And we picked the lowest risk project we could think of, uh, and that is uh, the use of methotrexate, which has anti-inflammatory properties, uh, combined with gold nanoparticles applied topically to psoriatic plaques. So topical means no or very little or no systemic um, exposure. So we're limiting uh, risk there. Uh, it's pretty easy to measure uh, psoriasis. And on the right hand side here, we've got some illustrative uh, histology showing the effect of uh, our product on the right hand side against the um, standard care diverbent in the middle and the control Vaseline on the left hand side. And we, we probably see is quite a nice reduction in uh, inflammation in psoriatic skin. So we're in the process of repeating these studies. Um, we hope to be able to report them uh, in the next few weeks. So a couple of slides on numbers now. Um, 2020 was a big year for restructuring for us after the switch up in strategy and the abandonment of MTD201. We closed uh, the factory that was being built in Bilbao, Spain, specifically for MTD201. Uh, so one-time cost there, but ongoing savings. So the company is currently burning three million pounds a half year or, four, or half a million per month. That will go up a little bit in the second half of this year and into next year as we start up the phase one GBM trial and a phase two trial in DIPG that I referenced earlier. Our cash at the half year was 4.2 million, although we did do a raise uh, in July, so pro forma 13 uh, and a bit million, uh, although we've burnt some cash since then, so we're now down at about 11 million, and that gives us a cash runway into the first quarter of 2023, by which time I would hope we would have one or more Acustera licenses on board, and we would have data for our uh, GBM study of uh, MTH110. So uh, just a few bullet points on what we've got done in the half year this year. Um, the cash rates I talked about, costs are under control. Uh, filing an IMD for um, a phase one trial in GBM. That market, by the way, is a three to five billion dollar market. There are a couple of products that are used, uh, Lomastine, Carmastine, uh, not particularly effective, highly toxic. Um, and so we think with our drug delivery method, combining with panabinostat, uh, we have a good chance of them making a, a meaningful impact on those patients. Uh, we delivered two proof of concept Qsfera formulations to our partners, uh, and we're waiting to hear whether they're going to take those forward. And we have initiated licensee search for Qbrexpiprazole, uh, as I indicated. And lastly, as I said before, the big news was the uh, monoclonal antibody exemplar data that we were able to show. So that's it for this evening. Thank you. And I would be pleased to take questions. Mike. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, so we'll just uh, quickly go over to the Q&A board here, see what we've got coming in. Uh, just a, a reminder to everybody just to check what questions are in there and then if you've got a new one, send it along to us as soon as you can and um, or and or vote for the ones that you can see there already. Um, right, in terms of the external QSphere programs, could you give us an idea of steps and timeline to a possible drug approval? That comes from Andrew. Right, thank you, Andrew. Um, so what we've delivered are proof of concept uh, formulations. So uh, we've got, we've encapsulated the APIs in Sphera. We know what the drug loading is. We know the injectability. We know the dissolution profile. Um, if the partner is happy with those, then they will initiate a phase one study. To do that, they will need GMP, um, that's good manufacturing practices, uh, manufactured product put into humans. Uh, and what we hope to see is that those data, the data in humans is uh, translates from the, the data that we've seen uh, in vitro and in animals. 
So that would probably take, uh, it would take us about a year to get to GMP manufacturing, uh, another nine months or so for a phase one study. And if that's successful, because these APIs are already approved, then you would need to do a phase three study under what's called 505B2 regulations. And that would take another year and a half, I would say, after that. Uh, and then you've got a one year approval process after that. So that's what does that add up to? About four years, I guess. And uh, just just as a matter of interest, uh, 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 if you if you're thinking about um, monetizing uh, any of that work at any point, where do you see the the sort of uh, exit points for you uh, as as Midatech in that process? So uh, I think the sort of structure we have in mind is well. Hitherto, we've been working under R&D collaboration agreements. It's almost like a fee-for-service basis, which pays our costs, um, a direct cost for that program at about between you know, three and 400%. It's not big money, to be honest with you. Um, so what we would propose then is to enter into a technology license, um, either immediately or after phase one proof of principle, and that we would hope would be a multi-million dollar uh, upfront fee. There would then be development milestones, so depending on, for example, phase three data, filing and approval, uh, and then the royalties based on sales thereafter. And I think we would expect to see high single digit type royalty rates. Right, okay, thank you. Um, Question for Malcolm here. Emergex has been in the media lately. Read the next gen of T cell vaccines with reference to gold NLs, which I understand Midatech licensed a few years ago to them. Um, will this milestone trigger a fee to Midatech? And why did Midatech decide not to uh, PR this, if so? It will not trigger a, a milestone for Midatech. Right. It's outside of. Uh, uh, any agreement we have with the MHX. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one from Malcolm here. And finally, congratulations on your milestone and excellent news with regard to your MAB exemplat moment. Why do you think in all the years of QSphere development, which I understand is many, nothing has ever been successfully developed off the back of it previously? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's quite, a, it's quite a good question that um, to be, uh, I, you know, I've only been here a year, but I can't claim this, that I've had much to do with it, to be honest, that smarter people than me have, have developed this. Um, I think there's been somewhat of a learning process over, over quite a long period of how the uh, polymers and the proteins interact, how to protect the protein, what polymer to use, what solvents to use, uh, what not to use, uh, and it all came together this year. Um, I can't really explain why it didn't come together earlier. You know, that's the nature of science and empirical uh, R and D. I think. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, why do you combine the roles of CEO and CFO? Um, this is a little bit unusual, I guess. Um, what do your larger shareholders think about this? Uh, well, that's a very good question, actually. And, and my wife asks me that all the time because it's <laughs> quite a lot of work for one salary. Um, uh, I, I took on the role because Craig left, uh, Craig Cook, previous CEO, left. And uh, it didn't seem the right thing to do to take on that type, that type of cost when we were sort of in, in the financial condition that we were in at the time. Um, I, turned, I kind of took it on myself to take on both roles, although I have to say I'm very ably supported in the financial role by our, our group controller, uh, Fiona Sharp. She does uh, most of the heavy lifting on that side. I do the investor relations and the sort of fundraising bit. I think, um, to be honest with you, Mike, if, if we can get one of these deals over the line in terms of a license, uh, with a Cusera product or a partnership with MTX110, that would be the right time to look at splitting the roles again. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, one from Andrew here. Could you tell us about the level of interest you're seeing from pharma with respect to QSphere proteins? Uh, I think you previously said you were now working with one partner. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, we're working with one partner and we'll stand by for some news there. I can't say too much right now until things are signed, but we're working hard on that partnership. Um, we uh, just did the Bio Europe conference. Uh, we had quite good conversations with a number of parties about our technology. And frankly, there was quite a bit of surprise, a bit like the, the gentleman who asked the question just now, like, you know, if you've been able to do this, what's been holding you back kind of thing. Uh, and so there's, there's quite a bit of follow-up to be done there and uh, show people under the covers to see the, the, the underlying data. But I'm hopeful that uh, sometime in the near future, we will have more partnerships uh, based around those exemplar data. Mm. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, one here about the share price. Anyone investing at an event similar to this two years ago would have, uh, would have lost about 90% of their their investment by now. Um, uh, what do you think caused the market to take such a dim view uh, to slash your valuation so dramatically uh, at that time? Uh, I know it's kind of before your, you came on board, I guess, but uh, maybe you've formed a view of that in, in, in hindsight. I think, uh, I think there's been several things, some of which I mentioned at the you know, beginning of the presentation. The, the um, escapade into the United States was frankly a disaster. Uh, and that was the start of the slide, and I think the loss of credibility in the marketplace. I think uh, putting all the eggs in the MTD201 basket uh, was a mistake, uh, particularly when it became evident we couldn't fund it, couldn't find a partner for it. So there was another loss of credibility there. Uh, and I think we've had, because of that, we've had to do a series of highly dilutive uh, fundraisers, which uh, has you know, damaged share price yet further. And some of those have entailed issuing significant numbers of warrants, which have sort of piled pressure yet further. So when you add all of those things up, it doesn't, I mean, I'm being brutally honest here, it doesn't make for a happy track record. All I can say is that um, the, the, the new strategy appears to be working. You know, we've got more, more options, more chances of success here. Can't guarantee any of them. But uh, I've got to believe that with nine products in the portfolio and five or six of them you know, available for licensing very shortly, that something's got to give. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a more consistent business model, again, I, I guess, at the moment. There's one here, actually, just kind of picking up on that. Uh, what liquidity events do you expect to be the most likely scenarios? And you sort of touched on that already in regard to one particular um, uh, uh, joint venture. But um, could you, is, there, is there anything you want to expand on that? Was that a typical model of what you see going forward for each of these streams that you're managing? Yeah. So um, QBREXPIPRESOL is ready. So we're either going to find a licensee for that or it's going to get shelved. We're not going to, we're not going to do any more work on it uh, currently. Uh, Q to Prolimus needs one more round of formulation, I think, then that will be ready. So there's two potential shots on goal there. We have our partner who we're in discussion with about expanding that partnership. There's a shot on goal there. There's the Q protein work that I referenced. I can't promise that we've got any sort of any term sheets there yet, because we haven't, but there's a potential uh, license opportunity there. And then lastly, we have MTX110, where we'll be getting, we've got the IPG data and we'll be getting GBM data uh, sometime towards the back end of next year. So I count those as five potential liquidity events. But I, I guarantee we won't get all five. Yeah. But, but one will be good and two will be great and three will be fantastic. Okay. Now, I think you said uh, cash burn at the present rate would take you through with your um, existing cash resources to about early 23, was it? First quarter 23. Right. Um, and um, does that assume any new projects are taken on or that's just based on your present uh, commitments? It does assume that we do more uh, Cuspera 
internal programs, yes. But to be so honest with you, they're, they're not they're not incrementally significantly cash burning because we've got all the people here in the overhead anyway. Right. You just have to buy some lab supplies and uh, you know a little bit of API. It's not it's not it's not huge because uh, and, and then we'll probably do a, an animal study or, or two or three. Okay, these, so it's these no are not not multi million dollar commitments by any stretch. All right, so the vast majority of the cost is really about the people, and um, so it's, a, it's about managing the team size, as it were, yeah. loading them up. Okay, right. yeah, understood. And the, other, and the other sort of variable is is time, because you might get lucky, and we'll you know pick all the right variables and uh, formulate the first time, but it usually doesn't happen like that. It usually requires multiple iterations, and that's been a bit of a learning for me to be honest with you this year. So. You can't assume success. So it's possible that some of these things, we won't have enough time between now and uh, we theoretically give out of the money to actually come up with the formulation because you've got to iterate so many times. Mm. We might be lucky. We'll have to see. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to hear from Malcolm again. Uh, given current price, which I think we can all agree has some room for improvement, but putting this aside with past failures and given current levels, there has been an unsurprising lack of insider purchases to align yourselves with current shareholders. Given your current confidence in new model, would you expect to be joining the shareholders soon? Okay, I think I get I get the message on that one. Is there? A, I I I think I noticed that you'd uh, bought the last time you bought shares was towards the end of 2019, um, and since then. Uh, there hasn't been any sign of you buying anymore. I suppose that's the kind of route for that question at the moment. Uh, yes, so that's true. I bought, I guess it was a million shares in 20, yeah, towards the end of 2019, which is now on, or 50,000 on today's, today's new money. Yeah. Um, yeah, to, to, be honest, to be honest, I, you know, I haven't received a pay raise or a bonus, so I don't have a whole lot of spare cash to put into my detect shares. Uh, as of today okay um yeah i'm sure i'm sure a lot of the viewers would would like to see some more there but i appreciate you can only you know, do that when you've got the spare cash so hopefully things will improve on that front um another one here on which companies and which technologies do you consider to be your main competitors companies and technologies okay What's out there uh, at the moment? Yeah. Uh, so the the main company, I guess, that's most like us is uh, MedInCell, which is listed on um, one of the European exchanges. They have a polymer-based technology. Right. Uh, there's another one called InnoTour, I believe, which is a private company. It's hard to find out too much about them. Mm -hmm. Those are the two that sort of spring to mind. And they're using similar technologies. Are there any sort of alternative technologies that would, you know, are banging around at the moment being developed that also compete with the polymer based technologies? Um, yeah, there's a, a few companies in the US. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who they would be. Ask me another one and I'll uh, come, I'll think of it. Okay. I can't think of the name of it now. Um, the only other question I've got on here at the moment is uh, who are your main shareholders? Um, I guess everyone can look that up really, but uh, are they mostly institutionals or? No, they're mostly retail. Right. Uh, okay. So uh, we have our institutional shareholders are CMS, China Medical System in the US, uh, sorry, in China. Right. Uh, and we have um, in London, uh, Lombard ODA. Mm -hmm. CMS, I think, I think it has about 15%, Lombard OVA, 7 or 8%, and pretty much everybody else is retail. Right, yeah, I've just taken a quick look at it on Stockopedia. So it's quite a high percentage, actually, or, uh, yeah. Um, so a good, good spread of retail investors. Okay, yes. thank you. Um, what is the uh, staff retention like in, at, at MidaTech at the moment, or in the recent past? Um, it's not bad. Uh, we had a, um, when we switched up the strategy and moved away from a uh, single product to sort of multiple shots on goal, uh, that we had a little bit of turnover then. Some people 
for fully understandable reasons, are more comfortable dealing with um, more advanced products where things are more stable and frankly, the job is more routine. Other people prefer to be innovating and inventive and doing, and so I'll give you an example in analytics, for example. Uh, some people are very good at doing analytical methods when there's a method established, all they're doing is repeating the test over and over again. Uh, other people prefer to be designing and developing new analytical methods for new products and don't want to be doing the same thing over and over again uh, and, and thrive on the pressure that, and challenges that brings. So we've had to migrate from one type of employee to another type. So the turnover has been, I don't know, we've lost six or seven people and gained seven or eight over, over maybe the last year. Right, right. And uh, it, it seems like the, uh, your, your cost pace has been pared back a bit. And that, is that mostly about people? Most, well, mostly about people. And the vast majority of that uh, is, um, was, relates to the uh, Spanish outfit, the factory ah, yeah. that, that we closed. OK, thank you. Um, well, got one one more come in just as we were talking there. How many more studies are you likely to launch in the next year? I think that's probably a subsidiary to the earlier conversation we had there. I don't, is it easy for yeah. you to guess? In the next year, there won't be any human studies launched by us because, oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of Custera. There won't be any based on Custera because we don't have uh, GMP uh, capability right. in the next year. But for NTX110, where we do have GMP manufacturing because it's done by a third party. Uh, we will launch the GPM study and we'll launch a phase two DIPG study. The interesting right. thing about the DIPG phase two study, uh, again, I can't promise this, but it has the potential, the potential to be a registration study because there are no other available treatments. So the right. FDA looks at those, you know, if there's a desperate need for treat for a, a therapeutic treatments, they sometimes approve products based on phase two data, especially ultra orphan products with a requirement to monitor the product on a patient by patient basis afterwards. So that is a possibility for us. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think we're out of, yep, no more questions at this stage. So Stephen, thanks very much for coming along and giving us a presentation. And um, well, I wish you well with the uh, what seems like a fairly busy uh, selection of uh, projects going on there at the moment. And uh, uh, maybe we'll get you back uh, when you've uh, hit a, an important milestone next year sometime. Look forward to that. All right. Thanks for now. Thank you. Thanks all.